my soul say yes.
just bow our heads now for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Thou knowest the heart of man, and how we thank Thee for this time of, of spiritual fellowship and worship uh, with these dear people in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, we pray that You will bless this little church and all of its affiliated little churches everywhere, the school. Bless thy people everywhere, Father. Give glory unto thyself and speak to us now further in the word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Brother Williams, both senior and junior, Brother Osborne, and brothers and sisters, may it never die. <laughs> may it stay alive. I am so happy this morning to know, after all these about 14 years, to come back into this church and find that same glorious spirit moving among the people. It is such a jewel, such a presence of God. It is so scarce. You, I'm sure this morning, you don't realize how well off you are. It's such a rest for my eyes to look upon people's faces and see the glory of God shining forth. Brother Tommy and I were sitting there, even watching little girls and little boys enter into that worship of the Lord. See women, young girls, middle-aged, old and all, wash faces and clean. Man expressing from their hearts. Yeah, I'm sure it's used to you're just used to it because it's an everyday occurrence for you. But to me, it's a jewel. One time there was a, an old fisherman coming from the sea and a man going to the sea for rest. And the man had worked. He was an artist. And he said he was going to take a rest, so he went down to the sea. He had never seen it before. He had read about it, saw the pictures of it. But he had never seen it before. And on his road that morning down to the seashore, he met an old salt or old sailor coming from the sea. And he said, Where goest thou, my good man? He said, Oh, sir, I'm going down to relax myself. I'm going down to the sea. He said, I'm so anxious to smell the salt from the briny waves as they play back and forth and frolic on the shore. I want to hear the scream of the seagull as it passes over. And he tried to explain how he was, what he was going to do. And the old salt said to him, said, I don't see nothing so attractive about it, but I've been on it for 40 years. I don't see nothing attractive about it. I think that's what's the matter, see, you just don't realize. You're just right in it all the time, see? But to me, it's a, it's a bouquet from heaven. That's, it's something real. See, you can get so used to anything until it isn't attractive to you much. But when it comes to the place, the one you have, you've read about it, you've heard about it, and then walk right into it. There's just something you, you don't, you're, you're kind of stumped for words to say. I had a little jubilee knot few weeks ago at Brother Outlaw's church out in, in Arizona. I, I just didn't understand. I was go my work amongst the people, and I tried to visit every organization, denomination, trying to work 
the best that I can, standing between the breaches for the people. When I walked up there that day and looked over that group and heard that choir sing like this morning and see those young men and young women standing there just in the, their faces glitter and look out and see an old person sitting there, their eyes just as shiny, the power of God, I just took down my collar and throw back my coat and, and then come into it again this morning. Maybe if I could go over another week now. <laughs> Kindly. So good. Brother William, God ever be with you and your son in this great work. Brother here, the missionaries and so forth, how I appreciate this. Never, never get away from it, friends. Stay with it. Stay with it. See, don't never let that spirit of worship and that clean holiness ever die among you. Keep that light burning, for it's the lifeline of the church. That's right. It's Christ in his church. I could just stand and talk to you a long time, but I got another meeting coming up in a little bit, and I, usually before those healing services, I like to stay just in the presence of God for a while and get there and pray and watch and wait until I know his presence is there, and they're going to have a prayer line this afternoon, I believe. Uh, I can't promise just when, but I wonder if passing through, I got your address here now, I didn't know where you was at. I come down this turnpike quite often going west. If I happen to come through here on a service night, I'll come in if you'll sing again for <laughs> like that. I just revive. I, I like that. Now, I never could sing. I can't carry a tune to save me. But, you know, one of these days when you all get home and your great big mansion up along on top of the hill, you know, and there's a little cabin, I think, for me, way down in the corner of the woods down there. <laughs> so. One morning you stand out on your porch watching across the hillsides and seeing the morning stars singing together. Way down the woods you hear a song coming up, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. <laughs> you say, well, praise God, old Brother Branham made it. There he is. He's down there just singing away. It'll be Amazing Grace, all right, when I get there. So I'm so grateful for his blessing. I want to call your attention this morning to Jeremiah, the 8th chapter, the 22nd verse. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? That's a mighty small text. But um, it isn't how small it is, it's the value that's in it. Many people go by quantity, but it's the quality we're talking about. Here some time ago, there was a little boy that I was telling you about found that up in an attic across the river from where I live. He found an old postage stamp. Looked yellow. And he had ice cream in his mind. So down the street he goes to find the stamp collector and he asked him, what do you give me for this stamp? Oh, he said, I'll give you a dollar. Well, he thought he'd only get a nickel, so he sold it for one dollar. A little later, that stamp collector sold that same stamp for five hundred dollars. Later, it went into the thousands of dollars, and I don't know what the value of it is it now. Now, it wasn't because of the little piece of yellow paper, because that wasn't worth picking up off the floor. It's what's on the paper that counted, and that's what this is here. It's what's on the paper. The Bible was purchased by Brother Kidson. His, Brother Kidson gave me this Bible about 14 years ago in uh, Houston, Texas, where I held one of my first revivals, and I've preached out of it ever since. The Bible probably cost about $20, but them words that I read in there is eternal life to everyone that believes. It's, it's God's Word. I want you to just take one, one word for a text. Why? Why? You know, if God makes a way for escape for his people and they don't accept it, then he wants to know why. Why did they do it? Why? And we're each one going to give an account for it. When God makes a way for healing and people don't accept it, then he asks, why? 
He's got a right to ask why, if we don't accept what he gave us. One time in the Bible, there was a king, and he's the king of Israel, and he was the son of Ahab and Jezebel. And one day when he was walking out on the lattice of his porch, he, he fell through the porch and hurt himself. He got real seriously sick. And then he called two of his men and sent them up to Akron to find out from the god Beelzebub, the great god of that country, whether to consult him, whether he was going to live or die. And way down somewhere along the creek bank in a little old mud hut was the prophet Elijah. And God spoke to Elijah, and he went and stood in the road. And he stopped these two messengers. And he said, go back and tell the king, why would he send up here to this God? Why would he send to this God up here a strange God? Is it because there is no God in Israel? Is it because there's not a prophet in Israel that he could consult about these things? Why then would he send up there? I wonder today, sometimes in our churches, when we like coming in here this morning, why would a man want to go to a roadhouse? Why would a young woman want to be on a dance floor? Why would people want to drink whiskey and to try to soothe their aching hearts when all this blessing and power of God is here for us? Why would we want to... Uh, to sign ourselves away to some denominational creed when the power of the Holy Ghost is here to make us happy and free. Why would we want to do it? It reminds me of a man dying on the doctor's doorstep with a disease that the doctor has a remedy for. Now, if, uh, if the doctor has the remedy and the man has got the sickness, and the man will come to the doctor's porch, and because he dies on the porch refusing the doctor's remedy, why, well, there's no excuse. Certainly not. If the, if the doctor has a remedy for the disease that he's got, and he's got plenty of the serum, uh, to, uh, the toxin to inoculate the man from the disease, and the man dies on the doctor's doorstep. It's not the doctor's fault. Neither is it the fault of the toxin. It's because the man won't take the toxin. That's exactly right. It's what reason he dies. Because he refuses to take the toxin. That's the reason he dies. That's the reason today that people are dying in the church pews of sin is because they refuse to take the toxin that God has given for the remedy, the remedy for their cure of heartaches, of ills and sicknesses, diseases of the heart, soul, and mind. People just refuse to do it. They say, oh, that's a bunch of holy rollers. That's a bunch of Pentecostals. And they go ahead and try to hush that blessed thing that God gives them. Did you ever think, why does a man drink? Why does a man, why does women, young girls go out and look like Mardi Gras and get out into these uh, dives and things? It's because that there is a place in their heart that's thirsting for something, and God created them to thirst, but to thirst after Him. And they try to hush that blessed holy thirst with the things of the world. Why, you're perverting the very thing that God gives to people to thirst for Him. You are trying to satisfy with the things of the world. It will not work. It never will work. And then if the devil can't get you to do that, he gets you just to put your name on a church book and call yourself a Christian. He tries to satisfy it with that. But there is no satisfaction until God Himself comes into the heart to control and to satisfy the people and bless them and give them the things that he created in their heart. He wants to fill that space. There's nothing else in the world that will fill it. Don't you all never forget that. 
Young ladies, these little girls along here, beautiful little things. You'll be brought up here to have long hair, dress right, but you'll be a target for Satan. Keep the power of God over you all the time. Don't never let it leave. This great, precious jewel that God has come into your heart for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, giving this happy and joy. When I was a boy, a kid, I tried everything I was big enough to do and a lot of things I wasn't big enough to do. I tried it anyhow, but I never found nothing that satisfied until God filled me with the Holy Ghost. And that put something in my heart that gave me a perfect satisfaction. Yes, you know how they, they work on a, a toxin for a disease. Now the prophet asked, is there no bomb, which is toxin? Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Isn't there no physician or no toxin? Then why hasn't the health of, of uh, the daughter of my people recovered? What's the matter with it? What causes it? There's no excuse. Now, how do they find toxin? The first thing they do, science works on uh, a certain different kinds of chemicals, and they mix it together in the laboratory, and they put germs under uh, the test and pour this toxin on it, then take the good germ and the bad germ and work together till they can find something that'll kill the bad germ, and unless it's an antibiotic, and, and leave the good germ. Now, when they think they've got it perfected, they take that serum and give it to a guinea pig and find out if that guinea pig will live or die. Now, sometimes it won't work on human beings. You can't be sure about medicine, because sometimes a medicine that will help one will kill the other. And they're working on some kind of a medicine or something to, to try to uh, cure the cancer. The other day when the communists raised up at that bottle, shook it before the world, and said, we've got a something here that will take a paralyzed man, after his paralyzed, muscle uh, condition has stopped acting, and bring those muscles back. That's a disgrace to the church. Deliverance wasn't given to communism. Deliverance is given to the church. That's right. The church of the living God. And I tell you, instead of proging back on that thought, the church ought to be moving ahead in the power of God, taking all this great power that we have among us and not, we, I love to blow the whistle. These, I just love it. There's that much kid about me yet. I like to hear the whistle blow, but yet keep a lot of steam in there to make the engine run also, you know, as she goes down the track. If we can only find where this great power that God has given us, it'll heal diseases. It'll discern the thoughts of the heart. It'll raise up the dead. It'll do great and mighty things if we'll just keep it right. Now, they say number one killer is heart disease. I differ with them. Number one killer is sin disease. That's the killer of the nation. It's sin disease. Sin is unbelief. It gets into the church, winds people around some kind of a man-made theology, a bunch of creeds. And the first thing you know, that person becomes an unbeliever, yet religious, but unbeliever. Religion is a strange thing to work with because the Antichrist is so close like the real thing till it'll fool the very elect if it's possible. Cain offered an offering just the same as Abel did, made an altar, got out, worshipped, put his offerings on the altar. He did everything just as religious as Abel did, but he come in the wrong way. God could not receive it. And Jesus said, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of man. We've got to get the right track. I say this, that man will never be able to come to God till we get on God's solid track that leads to the place. We've got to get the right disease killed. We've got to get the right disease, and the disease that's to be killed is sin disease, unbelief. And we'll never get it until we get the right toxin. We've got to get the right toxin, and that right toxin is in the economy of God somewhere, or he'd have never wrote the prescription. That's right. He'll never do it until we get to that spot, get to that place. Let's search it and see where it's at. See if there's a prescription. See what the toxin is. Then when we find that, then we've got the killer. Now some people say, well, now wait just a minute. You know, I just can't keep from smoking. I, I'm a church member, but I just can't keep from it. 
I, I go to dances and I, I just can't keep from it. You know what's the matter? They haven't took the toxin yet. They haven't been inoculated because this toxin was not tried in a guinea pig. God never put it in a guinea pig. He put it in himself. And he tried it in himself to see if it would work. Now there was a time when the toxin wasn't too good because it was put into sheep and goats and heifers and so forth. But now it's been proven in God himself. He was the one who come to tuck the toxin. On the bank of Jordan, he was inoculated when the heavens opened and the Spirit of God come down to dwell in him. He was inoculated. He walked along the Jordan banks. He cast out devils. They spit in his face and he turned the other cheek. They pulled handfuls of beard. It was put under every test that it could be put under. And it proved to be true. He never asked a guinea pig to take it. He took it himself. It was a man-sized job. So God was made flesh and dwell among us to take the toxin upon himself. He was the one who discovered it. He was the one who tried it on himself. He didn't ask anyone else to take it. He got it himself in his own body. Then we find out at the day at the cross, when it comes facing death, the toxin helped. The toxin was true. It was right. They found out when they spit on him, he could still pray for them. When they drove nails in his hands, he said, Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He, he practiced what he preached. He did exactly because the toxin that he was inoculated with, it held out. One asked one time, Can my son set it to right and left hand? He said, That's not mine to give, but can you be inoculated? with the same serum that I've been inoculated with. Can you take God's inoculation? Then on Calvary, it proved out that it helped. It was all right. Now the proof comes, will it raise the dead? But on Easter morning, the inoculation still helped, for the seals broke around the grave. The angel of the Lord came forth, and it rolled out the stone and the Son of God who was in the grave, God himself made flesh among us. He came forth to prove that the inoculation would hold in temptation, in sickness, in death, and in resurrection. It would still hold. He would still hold. Why is the daughter of my people sick? Is there no bomb in Gilead? There's plenty of it. He poured it out from on high. When the disciples saw and the people that were called to eternal life saw that inoculation that could turn the cheek on that side and that side. One that could go in the face of death and have an assurance that the Scripture was right. When a man's inoculated with God's inoculation, which is the Holy Ghost, will agree with every word that God said. They'll never penknife the Bible to take some theology of some man. He'll take every word that God wrote. It'll say, it's the truth. It's the truth. Jesus had a truth because God said to the prophet, I will not suffer my Holy One to see corruption, neither will I leave his soul in hell. That was the needle that punched into his veins. But on Easter morning, he knew that he'd come out of there because the Bible had said so. And corruption sets in in 72 hours. Three days and nights, he would have to rise or the Scripture be broken. So the Scriptures cannot be broken. It cannot be broken. God promised it. Just live it right to the letter. There was 120 wanted that same inoculation one day. They had seen him. Oh, praise God. Jesus said, if you want the inoculation, go up there at Jerusalem and wait. Don't get excited. Just wait. I'll send it. We got a whole prescription of it upstairs. And they were waiting, and all of a sudden, there came a sound from heaven. The inoculation was on its road, like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting clove and tongues set up on them like fire. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What was the matter? They would become inoculated. Oh, when they got out in the street and they began to see the manifestation of God, then the people began to cry, saying, Well, what meaneth this? What is all this about? And what must we do to be saved? Now, God put a, pre 
a, not a preacher, but a doctor in his church. Is there no physician? Is there no serum? Is there no bomb? Is there no, there's plenty of bomb, they've seen it. Now they got a doctor that'll write the right prescription. Yes, sir. Dr. Simon Peter told him what to do. He said, repent every one of you. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost for the promise to you and to your children and to them that sorrow, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Peter never said this is just a prescription for today. It's a prescription to your children and to your children's children and to the land of far off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That prescription works on them. That prescription works on me. That prescription will work on you. That prescription will work on everyone. That's the Lord God calls. Now what's the matter with the world? It's sin sick. Here's the prescription wrote out. There's plenty of toxin. I felt it all over me this morning. It's still all over me now. And I know that that toxin has eternal life in it. For it raised me from a little old sinner to make me a Christian, a believer on God. Something stirred my soul. It set me throughout the world. Tommy Osborne, different ones. It'll send you. What's the matter with the church? It's because they refuse to take the prescription. That's all there is to it. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Oh, yes, we got physicians. We got bombs. We'll not give them some false prescription. We'll write the right thing out for them. Just exactly, Peter said, this is prescription. Dr. Simon Peter had the right idea. He said, what must we do? How long will it last? He said, to you and to your children and to them that far off, even as men as the Lord our God shall call. This prescription will work. It'll inoculate the people from sin if they'll just take the prescription. What must we do to be saved? And he wrote out the prescription. There's bomb in Gilead. There's toxin. And there is doctors also. So why does the people die? Why does the people die in their sins? Because they refuse to take the prescription and have it fulfilled. You believe that? Yes. Holy Spirit's here now. This is, this is God's toxin. Forever sin sick soul. God's toxin. The Holy Ghost. Oh, I, I feel like if it wasn't so late, I believe I could preach right now. Just kind of getting myself wound up. Just feeling good. Let us bow our heads. Lord Jesus, great giver of eternal life, great Father of the Spirit of the righteous, we thank Thee, O Lord, for Thy goodness and for Thy mercy. I want to thank You, Lord, for this little church, for all it stands for and its goodness and, its, and the things that it's done in Thy name. O Father God, the Bible said that He is a rock in a weary land. And the name of the Lord is the mighty tower. The righteous run in at it, into it, and are safe. Oh, in this weary land where we travel and see people swallowed up in the world, churches, formal, indifferent, dying in sin because they refuse the toxin. What a wonderful thing to come into the presence of that rock in a weary land. Oh, may this church always stand that way, Father. May it stand filled with toxin. Oh, Lord God, grant it. May weary souls fall in here and be saved. Grant it, Lord. Give them, bless our brother Williams, both of them, the senior and junior. Bless this missionary going into the field, the associating pastors and different ones from different churches. Our most gracious brother, uh, Tommy Osborne. Lord, be with him as he travels from place to place around the world, giving souls. Keep this little church as it is written, a shelter in the time of storm, that we might run in and out of the mission fields and have our souls charged, have the refreshments, O oh Lord, set on in the ship of the earth, and hear the angel of the Lord talk to us. How thankful we are for it. Pray that it will never, may the light never go dim. May the barrel never be empty or the cruise run dry, Lord. May the children of God be fed from real Doctors that will write the prescription clear and clean and preach the word and not compromise on any of it. May there come a Holy Ghost revival through here, Father. As the brother said a while ago, may it burn into every heart until sin-sick souls can be inoculated from sin so that they can have the confidence and the hope of the resurrection. 
of the Lord Jesus coming for them in the last days. Grant it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Such a wonderful time. Oh, this is like heaven to me. Anyone sick, raise up your hand. Say, I don't want to be prayed for. God is the healer. God is the great healer. For the last 45 minutes, there's been a name keep coming before me. I don't know why. Maybe it'll be in the meeting or somewhere. I don't know. I, uh, names. It's somebody praying or somebody fixing to want something. I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, the Lord will grant it. The name seems like it says Cozard or something. K-O-Z-A-R-D or something on that order. It just looks like I keep seeing it or something ringing in my ears. A Cozard. A Cozard or something like a K-O-Z-A-R-D. Maybe somebody will be in the meeting somewhere that it'll happen, but it just keeps ringing out in my heart. And then before me, I keep seeing the name. Somebody praying for something somewhere. Now the Lord Jesus knows all things. He, he provides and prepares for everything. Now, uh, if you're sick, let's bow our heads for prayer. Oh, Lord.